But I then decided that I couldn't sit back and allow other 14-year-old kids to be put through what my son went through with the personal hearings. I can't believe that at the time, the Football Association guidance said that, you know, a 14-year-old could go into the same room as the very people that abused them. I work in HR and we wouldn't do that in HR with adults. Hello everyone, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special edition, or our 10th edition of The Final Whistle. Stop nodding, and we've got a very special guest of, uh, of Kerry, who's Ref Support UK's Parental and Youth League Ambassador, but he also does work for the, for the RA, which I'll explain in a minute. Kerry, you might have noticed, um, well, do you explain how, how I met her electronically? But it's a bit basically it ended up in the FA changing some of their processes of how they deliver with, um, they deliver discipline and other procedures with regards to the FA. So Kerry actually created a paper that, that brought it out positive change nationwide by dealing with the FA and Mark Hives. So so ladies, gentlemen, and anyone else listening, welcome to Kerry. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Welcome. Hello. Thanks, um, thanks for the introduction. No, that's all right. Kenny, when, I know I don't want to sound like this was Tinder or something, but we, we met online. <laughs> <laughs> we met online through through um Twitter. And uh, it was a bit of a a bit of a negative sort of engagement in the beginning, wasn't it? But obviously the outcome ended up being wonderfully positive outcome down to your drive and commitment and intelligence. Do you want to just explain that how the journey started and where you are now? Yeah, so um, just to make clear, gents, I am not a referee, as you know. Never have been. I'm not that crazy. Um, but I have a 14-year-old son um, who, from the age of 10, he's obsessed with football, always has been. He plays, he watches. Um, you know, from the age of three, you'd go down the local park and, and watch Sunday football, you know, and listen to all the swearing and, and loved it. Um, but from the age of 10, he wanted to be a referee. So he did his course when he was 14. Um and in his very first game, um, I never experienced anything like it and, and I hope neither of us ever do again. But it was an under-12 game and the two coaches on, on this one particular team were horrific. He missed an offside in probably about the 10th minute and was literally for the rest of the game berated, shouted at, abused. The coaches were kicking things on the sideline, they were swearing. Um, they wound the players up to the extent where the players, these 11-year-olds, were scrapping on the pitch. Um, we walked away from that with me telling both those coaches they were an absolute disgrace to junior football. Um, and my son then sat in the car really upset. Um, he did go on two hours later to referee another game, an 11 v 11, um, which was absolutely brilliant. You know, totally different game. But then what that then led to, obviously, we reported these two coaches. Um, and the, the first thing that we heard from the county FA, and we had no idea of the processes, all the procedures, we were new to all of this. It's not something that's taught on the refs course. So he did his report. We then got a phone call from our county FA to say that these two coaches had requested a personal hearing. Well, I didn't know what a personal hearing was at the time. I work in HR, so I understand the investigations and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, we were told that a personal hearing is where um, basically these two coaches could put their case forward for the, you know, that they hadn't done this or it was a not guilty kind of plea. Um, and I was really shocked because my view was, I was sort of like, hang on a minute. So you've got a 14-year-old child who has been brought to tears by two adults who had screamed and shouted at him for, you know, an hour, and you want to put my son, the 14-year-old kid, back in the same room as the very two people that abused him as if he has got a case to answer? Um, I said no. It, it wasn't happening. There was no way that was happening. It was then offered online, um, my son was was still just too upset and, and too emotional and angry to, to be dealing with that. So the hearing did go ahead. 
Um, and unfortunately, because the hearings, all this stuff works off, you know, the balance of probability, because there was only one witness there in person, these two guys got away with it. Um, as a mother, never mind as, as a parent of a referee, as a mother, I was furious. Um, so I've taken to Twitter to start to talk about, you know, our experiences and abuse of, of new and young referees. And that's when, obviously, I got chatting to, to yourself, Martin, through ref support. Um, obviously, at the time, really appreciative of, of your help and support because I felt we were, I felt we were on our own to an extent. I didn't know the process. I didn't know how it worked. I was, you know, completely new to all this. Um, I can probably tell you word for word now. Um, guidance note seven point three on personal hearings because I know those like the back of my hand now. Um, I didn't at the time, and I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't think that our county FA dealt with it particularly well at the time um, because safeguarding weren't involved. We didn't get a call to ask about my son's welfare or how he was. It was all about the process. Um, that then led to, um, through ref support, we ended up going on um, talk sport. And then I happened to respond to a tweet from the Hal Athenaika, who is a presenter on Five Live. And um, he then invited me onto Five Live. So we sort of snowballed from there. But I then decided that I couldn't sit back and allow other 14-year-old kids to be put through what my son went through with the personal hearings. I can't believe that at the time, the Football Association guidance said that, you know, a 14-year-old could go into the same room as the very people that abused them. I work in HR and we wouldn't do that in HR with adults. So with the support of, of Martin, ref support, and a number of other people that I then got to know in the refereeing community, I decided to start a campaign um, to change the way that personal hearings were dealt with for those under the age of 18, for children basically, and to help safeguard them. So I did lots of research. I spoke to referees, I spoke to their parents, I spoke to junior football clubs, I spoke to referees associations, I spoke to county FAs. And I pulled together a paper which ran to probably 17 pages long in the end. Um, the result of that was some really good and useful conversations with Mark Ives, who was head of judicial services at the FA at the time. Some great conversations with Mark. Um, Mark very kindly took that paper. He read it. He listened. He took that to the discipline committee. They agreed that changes should be made, and in July, it was passed through the FA Council. So, basically, national regulations were changed. Nobody now under the age of 16 is allowed to attend a personal hearing in person. If you are under 18, you can choose whether you attend or whether that is done online. But Mark Ives, to be fair to him, took it a little step further that anybody that is considered potentially as a vulnerable adult can also request that, that it's done online as well. There will be some changes coming up in terms of referees training, um, but that's the next season. We haven't quite got that in quick enough yet um, around, you know, the way that they deal with, um, you know, young referees and things like that. So I was really pleased that that, that was changed. Um, yeah, really pleased with that. I think that deserves a round of applause. Absolutely. I was going to say the same thing. It's like, wow, this uh, this horrible situation that you've affected yeah. some real change with. Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. You, you've, you've got to get a positive out of something negative. And I couldn't sit back and because I was angry. And I have to admit, my son let it go very quickly. Mm. I didn't. Mm. I still, six months down the line, wanted to kill the coaches. No, obviously not physically, um, but I was still really angry, <laughs> really upset. Um, and and I, I'll be honest with you, it, it, the impact on me was then every game I went to watch my son referee, I would get up in the morning with, you know, that anxiety in the pit of my stomach of what if that happens again? Um I am now, I now deal with things differently. I will challenge coaches now in a, in a good way. And I also have challenged parents as well when they've been shouting at referees, not just my son, but all the young referees. So I've learned a lot from it. Um, and I'm now more confident in the way that I deal with abuse at junior football because it is abuse. If you're going to shout aggressively 
at a child who's 14, 15 years of age on a football pitch. That is abuse. So th- th- there's no arguments with that. It's abuse. Yeah. Yeah, we've said, we've said similar things, haven't we? We've said it's child abuse. If this happened in the street and it wasn't on a football pitch, oh, yeah. the, the ramifications of it would be so much worse than they are when the FA get involved. And for the FA for so long to think, well, we'll just invite this 14-year-old child in for an FA hearing and they can like fight their case against coaches who have abused them. I can't believe it's taken a, an outside force like yourself, Kerry, to come in and say, hang on, what are you thinking here? Can you not see what you're doing to children? I think that, uh, Nathan, from your point of view, resilience and, and stuff like that, how much work have you done in regards to what Kerry flashed up as a parent? Because I don't think parents of Matt officials, yeah. particularly under the age of 18, 16, really get considered in, in standing there watching you know, their child get threatened and, 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 and verbally abused. Because remember, a year almost to the day before we got in touch with uh, each other, Perry and I, was the Max Ormisher case, which it, it was almost identical. And when I pointed that out to Kerry, she was like, I can't believe that. That made you a bit more angry, didn't it, Kerry? Because you thought, well, those yeah. changes were... And then Max's dad, Glenn, who always said, if you ever need me for anything because of the help we give him, get back in touch. He went on talk sports and he said, look, the FA promised everything and yeah. nothing happened. Absolutely. Let's not this just be Emperor's new clothes. And, and I think we had a reference point then. We had and actually this isn't just what happened to, to, to Kerry's son. We've had Max Ownership. We've had another girl called R- Rianne, whose whose mother's really active on social media and works with us a lot. So there's this sort of negative le- legacy happening where, you know, what what are you going to do to change things? And then obviously having someone a juggernaut of a drive <laughs> professional from, from Kerry, they were to ever going to get away. And of course, that's where we've always wanted to be with the assaults. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. More to reference, more to reference where yeah. before someone gets murdered, we want something to change. And I think we're getting closer and closer there. We carry out, we have discussions because I, everyone knows what I do. I intentionally pull people's tail because it gets discussed. If you don't pull someone's tail, it just becomes a dead sweet. But we'll get, we go, we'll go at clubs, we go at individuals, we go at county FAs. Essex County of A only this past Sunday tweeted us saying thank you very much for flashing what happened up to us of a referee getting a pair for easy eardrum. So we know we're starting to climb that ladder of people to go, actually, we need to do more. And Kerry, what Kerry did is a good example of that. So from a child and parents' point of view, what's your take on that, Nate? Well, I, I think it's um I think it's interesting, you know, because one of the things that I've been doing a lot of work with, or well, prior to the pandemic, certainly was doing a lot of work with county FAs on was, was trying to help new, newly qualified officials um, with the workshops that we've been talking with uh, a lot of the RDOs about, um, you know, how can we do something that will help, or, or what do you need us to do, rather, I should say, to help the, um, the newly qualified referees deal with parents' spectators to deal with club officials, to even deal with players. Because I think even when there's sometimes players who are a little bit younger than them or even with players who are uh, the same age as them, which I think there's some sort of dubiousness as to whether they should be doing those games when they're newly qualified or not. But I know that certainly giving them strategies to deal with that and, and talking through situations that they've had uh, has definitely helped. And I think that massively uh, they can help my colleagues can massively help each other by talking about these experiences that they've had together and, and just all the work that they've really done is, is really, really um, difficult to understand um, how they deal with it. But what I would say, just just sort of as a bit of a point from, from what Kerry said, I think, it's, I think it's great that her son in particular has uh, that characteristic. You know, and that, you know, obviously, uh, I've, I've spoken about it on here before. I'm a mental toughness practitioner, um, and a lot of my work goes around doing reports on people to see how mentally tough they are and things like that. So, I think that one of the things that I'm really sort of pleased to hear is that what it sounds like to me is that Kerry has a very naturally mentally tough son, which I think is a key characteristic for referees because, um, you know, obviously we have a lot of difficulty to deal with and, and it's a very big part of the job. Uh, 
uh, if I can just touch on though as well, you know, talking about the whole situation about going into county FAs and defending yourself as a young referee, I, I saw something in relation to um, the Merseyside derby at the weekend talking about the, the tackle with Jordan Pickford on Virgil van Dijk. Um, and, and a lot of people say, if that happened on the street, and another fan said, if that happened on the street. I think that one of the things that, um, that, that seems to be accepted in football generally is that there's this, uh, and I saw um, a lawyer or a, a, a tweeting about this uh, after that Merseyside derby, is that there's this, um, I'm not entirely sure if I've got the legal word in this right, but it's something along the lines of implied sporting intent or something like that. And it seems that this is a, a clause within the legal system that means that, you know, obviously I know that, Martin, you've talked about going to the sentencing council and things like that, but this seems to be, in my mind anyway, in my reading of it, from what that legal expert said, is it seems to be what they're kind of hiding behind, or not hiding behind, maybe that's not the wrong turn of phrase, but it seems to be what, it seems to be the reason why prosecutions and various things that in relation to what happened on a football pitch or, or, or in terms of the FA directives of what's happened within the, within the FA traditionally. Um, I think those things are all really, really crucial um, reasons as to why these things that obviously uh, Kerry's just started to change with the, with the paper and, and the things that are coming up in the next uh, sort of next season. I think these are all reasons why those are enshrined. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that I think these are reasons why these things are enshrined in, uh, in, in, the, in the systems, in the legal system and in the FA system. Well, yeah, no, I'll back up what, what your point was there, because in the same reason that two boxers having a fight in a sporting event uh, won't be, you know, arrested for a fray or assault or anything like that because they are taking part in the sport in which they are competing, that stuff that's on the field of play is is the same sort of thing, but we've got to we've got to kind of accept there's some extra, not extra judicial because that's not the right way of saying it, but things that happen beyond the norm in football, like the referee getting assaulted, isn't part of the game. There's no way that could be considered part of a normal game. Yeah, or even in fact, carry on what you just said there. If one of the boxers turned around and gave the sort of give the referee a right up. Well, I've seen boxers arrested for doing that. So, see, that's that's the thing. That's the, the situation. That, that but also, look what happened with the Cantona and uh, Crystal Palace when he jumped into the crowds. Yeah. So, I mean, he he never got banned from every stadium in, in Great Britain for two years, but the fan did. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, there's this crossover which has always been there for a while, which, again, you know, um, when we wrote to the FA and said about getting the designated as a vulnerable role, all that will kick in. Yeah. All that will kick. We don't need to go to the sentencing council. Yeah. Because the sentencing council is after the person has been assaulted. Mm -hmm. We want to do as much as we can to stop people getting assaulted. Yeah. That's why I've always been against the sentencing council. I know Kelly's a bit more aware of what's going on than me, but that's too late. Maybe to concentrate on getting the deterrence and stronger measures that the FA can bring in immediately. They can do it at any time. It doesn't have to be seasonal. We, yeah. We've had this discussion with Mark Ives. That's where us and the RA should be going together in a cohesive approach mm -hmm. to say, can you help us get a referee, as you said you're going to do with the FA, designated as a vulnerable role? Absolutely huge amounts of protection will come in then. They will get arrested automatically. You don't have to worry about, oh, have you got it on foot to do a lend make a statement? All these things kick in automatically, mm -hmm. automatically. So it's no use going to the Centres of Council. But that's post Assault's yeah, too late. We need to be doing something to prevent it happening first. And as you know, we've got a barrister on board with it. We're quietly getting on with what we're doing. And hopefully in a not too distant future, we'll be able to go answer that one. Yeah. yeah. I yeah, really, I really hope, time. though, Martin, that you know what you always, what you always take, what you always say, Martin. I really, really hope it's not the case that somebody gets like a referee. I'm talking about here gets a brain injury, or worse than that, is is killed. And that, that is the ultimate reason for why it's happened. I, I really, really hope we don't get to that situation because what I will say, and I've said this before, we've had this discussion previously on, on, on previous episodes, I think we had a very sombre episode when we talked about the Sat Yang case initially. You know, unfortunately in this country, um, and I know that Sanjay Bandari, the chair of Kick It Out, um, has, has also kind of endorsed the same sentiments as what I've seen 
we we have had in this country since the Brexit referendum a real rise in racially aggravated sort of incidents within on a, within football on a football pitch. You know, sexism has, has gone up, and and so is homophobia. You know, uh, I told you guys earlier privately, and I don't mind saying this, although you might have to cut it out depending on what you think. Um, I have had to send two players off for use of homophobic language this season. I can't recall ever having done that before. In a, in a previous season, yeah, I've I've not sent off for homophobic, but I have sent off a racist. Um, and there was one as well. I don't know if I mentioned this before on the podcast that um, I was refereeing in Wales whilst I was at uni, and I heard racist language used. I did nothing. I and and I still think about that now, like fifteen years later, like. <laughs> Uh, it, it's one of those things that stays with you I think if you don't take action when you know you should have yeah. that's horrible one of the things I wanted to um, talk about if we can is the, the next thing that Kerry's working on which will be another national campaign is, is mentoring and before I get Kerry to explain a little bit more about that if, from when, he, when you two started which is relatively recent with regards I know Anthony you've been going for a while but well, you've been involved in promotion and stuff like that. Did you ever get offered mentors when you, you know, passed a course or any media post, you know, course support? I was assessed, I think, on one of my very first games, like a, a proper formal assessment. Um, and it just absolutely slated me. In one of my very first games, as a newly qualified referee, and uh, it was, I was it was open age. It was a competitive game. Uh, goals were flying in all over the place. I had not been given any mentoring or anything. I'd literally passed the course. I'd maybe done a couple of youth games during the course while it was on, because uh, you had to um, pass a laws of the game test. Um, or, or I can't remember how it was, but there was a certain point you got to whilst doing the course then you could start refereeing youth games or friendlies or something like that. So I'd already started doing a couple of games um, refereeing my brother's youth team. Um, and then when I'd passed the course, one of the first games after becoming a qualified referee at level seven was assessed. Uh, and it, it was um, it was horrible. Like this, this guy had come along. I don't know if, if he knew that I was a new referee, but he had slated me, told me I'd missed fouls, told me I'd missed offside, told me my positioning was awful, told me my fitness was crap. Um, literally everything that a referee could do wrong uh, was in that report. And I got a copy of this report. He gave me a very, very brief uh, debrief at the end of it, just saying you'll get uh, something through in the post uh, to, to, you know, for your assessment wise, use it for pointers and whatever. Um, and I remember getting that through and thinking, wow, I'm shit. Like what? What's the no, point of even nothing constructive in there? Nothing, nothing constructive at all. No, and it wasn't until a while later in that season I'd had a few more. Uh, I joined the local RA um, and mentioned. By that point, I'd had a couple of more assessments. They were they were improving. They were done by other people as well that were a bit more constructive, a yeah. bit more. Uh, at the end of it, there was a proper debrief to him um, giving instructions about positioning and and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I, I did mention this very first one uh, at the end of the season, all of the referees, league secretaries got together uh, to the referee secretary of that league and said, um, just, I mean, I got a really bad assessment at the start of the season. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, I just got that. I saw it myself. I just threw it in the bin. And I was like, but surely at that point, did you not think I'll have a word with the assessor and say, this kid is, I, was, I think he was like 18, 19 at the time. So a kid for all intents and purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, brand new to refereeing, hadn't done much before, freshly qualified, uh, and was refereeing open age, one of the very first open age games I was doing. Uh, but that didn't seem to register on his radar to kind of have a go at the assessor. Uh, the assessor, for whatever reason, uh, I assume would just carry on doing that if, if he wasn't getting pulled up for it. And then me, I mean, my brother and I qualified at the same time. I was 19, he was 14, 15, something like that. Um, he did a handful of youth games and then just jibbed it in, uh, cause he was just, he was abused, uh, badly. Like he did a, a, one of these summer tournaments, um, 
got, did a final because all of the older refs had gone home early uh, with their free burgers and their match fee for the day. So they weren't going to stick around. Um, and he did a final. Both teams absolutely got on his back, called him all sorts. And he was like, Fuck, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. Um, which potentially, if, if I hadn't, if, if I had been a different mindset when I got that assessment through, I would have gone, well, clearly I'm awful at refereeing, so I'm just not going to do it anymore. What's the point of doing it? Yeah. Uh, the, the match wasn't an enjoyable match. I, all, I will always remember it. There was a couple of red cards. I was out there doing my best. But in yeah. terms of having a mentor, someone to just like coach me and help me or even just be there for me on the first few games so I could talk to before the game, at halftime, at full time, you know, yeah. They don't even have to do any coaching. They could just literally stand there and say, uh, how, do you, how do you feel that you've done? What do you think you could have done better? And then or maybe just chipped in some ideas for, of themselves. Yeah. That that was missing, uh, which which is a shame because I'm, I'm sure at the time it was one of the things that was promised to us uh, as the game. You know, once you qualified as a referee, you'll get a mentor or um, – you get something for your first 10 games or whatever. And then when you do those 10 games, you, you'll mentor will get you signed off or whatever. But that, that was, that was missing from when I first qualified, but that was, I want to say almost 20 years ago. It was about 2002, 2003, something like that. I think I was very lucky to be honest. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I, did, I, the way I came into refereeing was with a friend said, you know, do you want to do the course with me? Um, and his dad had been a referee who got to about sort of a, uh, I think what it would be now is at level two A, um, and um, it, it, he was a great mentor for me. Really funny guy, really lovely guy, really warm guy, and that really helps. I think when you, you know, I was sixteen when I when I started, and um, I think when you're quite nervous about doing things. And I, I remember I did I did my first game, and and uh, I, I can't remember the result. I only remember the home team, but the, but I do remember the guidance he gave me because the clubs give me the same feedback, which was really good, which was about being more clear with signals. So I, and, and so that immediately into the next game, you think, right, okay, I need to be a bit more clear with the signals. So I'm going to bang up an arm for a corner. I'm going to get that arm right out when, when there's a throw in. I'm going to, I'm, if I have to give a penalty, I'm going to be really sharp. I'm going to be on the spot. I'm going to point to it nice and clearly. And it gives you really something to work with. And I think that, you know, I was talking with uh, a sports psychologist it was actually David Charlton who was on a previous uh, episode of this. Um, uh, of this, uh, I was talking to him yesterday, and he was saying to me, talking about golf. But I, th I think that the principles of coaching apply uh, across the board. If you give somebody nine or ten things that are, are critical of what they've done, it's overwhelming. It's too much. It's 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 too difficult to deal with. If you give them one or two, maybe three at a push pointers, there's three solid things they can. They can take, and if you've got a mentor for five or six games, your first five or six games, you give them two or three. Hopefully, they'll apply them in the next game. Then you give them the next two or three. And you break it down. You make it in manageable chunks, and that's the best way that I believe you can support a young referee or a referee who's a new referee and is learning learning to referee ultimately. Well, this is where it brings in lovely to what Kerry wants to do. And Kerry's backgrounds, apprentices, and all that sort of stuff. She's she wouldn't call herself, but I think she's an expert in it. And you touched on that, the stuff that, there's lots of stuff that is transferable. You know, there's, I know not one model fits all, but there is sort of boundaries of how you deliver it. And before Kerry explains a little bit more, if you remember a while back, one of our previous blogs, I took a lad to me who did a similar role to Kerry um, to watch a game. And it, someone had an heart attack in, in the stand. So the referees are 2A now. So I said to him, right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort it all out. And I went out and I talked to the secretary. I talked to both managers. I come back in and said, oh, everyone's going to be delayed. Went back in to the dressing room, said to the referee, look, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. Oh, thanks, Matt. Blah, blah, blah. Everyone was happy. Delayed second half. Going home in the car, my mate said, you want me to come to you and give you some feedback? I said, yeah. He said, did you think it was good you going out and talking to the captains, you going out and talking to the secretary, you going out and talking to the... Because they didn't know you were. They were like, who's this lad? And how did that help the referee? Because they just think, oh, is he the boss, not the referee? You should have gone in the dressing room and said, right, pass on my knowledge. Now you go and deliver that knowledge. And I think that ties in well to what Kerry's probably going to talk about now. If she unmutes herself. Yeah, so I, I think for me, um, I didn't want 
I didn't want to stop what I was doing in terms of, you know, helping young referees, supporting young referees. So obviously I've got involved with ref support um, as, a, as a parental ambassador, but I've also got involved now with the Referees Association in terms of welfare. So one of my um, one of my sort of key aims is around campaigns. So the big one for me is probably mentoring because, and it came from something the sun said, and it was probably just before the start of this season. And he said to me, do you know what, Mum? He said, I didn't have a clue what I was doing in that first game. And he said, he doesn't excuse two adults abusing him, but he actually admitted he had no idea what he was doing. Um, so I then started to look into, and obviously he does have mentors, but they're mentors that I have organised. So I made sure we joined our local RA, we did Stockport Refs Association, they're fantastic. So he has mentors through that. His dad's friend um, is also a referee, so he mentors him. Um, and I, as obviously my job, I work in learning and development, I'm a learning and development manager, so I'm a qualified coach. Um, I work with apprentices. I train mentors in work um, of how to look after our young apprentices. We've now got an award-winning apprenticeship programme at work, and we wouldn't have had that if we didn't have great mentors. It's the mentors that make that programme because they're the people that develop our youngsters and our young apprentices. So we need to transfer that over into, into refereeing. So I started to ask people who had done referees courses recently, you know, what mentoring did you get? Um, the vast majority, if I'm honest, came back and said, nothing. You know, we, we did the course and the course states, if you look on every county FA website, um, it states that as part of the course, you will do five games at 9v9 or 11v11, obviously with offsides. And then you come back after that once you've done those five games and that is when you qualify. But that you will get a mentor for those first five games. So I started to ask people, so my son had no mentoring from the county FA in those first five games. Um, I've spoken to other parents now and other newly qualified and young referees, and half of those parents said to me, what, is that a thing? It, does that, is that supposed to happen? And I said, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's on the website. It's what you pay your, you know, as part of your fee for the course, you're 120 to £170. Pounds. That's what you pay for. So I decided to just check this out and bear with me, I've, I've, I've got it in an email. So I decided to check this out with the National FA just to see what was supposed to happen. So what they told me was that all county FAs offer mentoring for newly qualified referees. Each county FA will offer support to each newly qualified referee with the level of support linked to the county FA's own individual mentoring support scheme. It must be stressed that not every newly qualified referee chooses to accept the support and they are free to decline the offer of a mentor. You only decline an offer of a mentor if it's offered in the first place. Um, so I'm not quite sure how, how well the, the FA know what's going on with the county FAs in terms of mentoring, but I have spoken to now probably eight or nine different people from eight to nine completely different county FAs and not one of them has, has been offered mentoring in those first five games. So my campaign, my next campaign, is around that mentoring and we have got to stop training up young referees, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds and just throwing them into the lion's den to be mauled and chewed up by, by adult coaches and parents because... That's what's happening in a lot of instances. Now, I know at the minute, obviously, the FA are, you know, it's desperate times. They're looking to save money. But I'm pretty sure there are county FAs out there that are doing this and doing it exceptionally well. I spoke to one in North East Wales a couple of weeks ago, um, and they explained how their mentoring programme works. So what I'm looking for is people to get in touch with me to tell me one of two things. So the first thing is, are you part of a county FA where you have been offered mentoring? And how's that worked? You know, what does that look like? Um, why has that been successful? But then I'm also looking to talk to people who have qualified in the last couple of years, who have received nothing, no mentoring, no support, um, you know, no updates on the laws of the game at the start of the season, just so that I can sort of come up with some percentages of who's doing it, who isn't but then try to spread the word about the great stuff that's going on. 
So the county FA I spoke to in North East Wales, their mentoring programme is now being taken up nationally by the Welsh FA because when they look at their retention figures, their retention figures for newly qualified referees are 60% higher than any of the other county FAs. And they put that down to having their mentoring programme. They mentor, guarantee mentoring for the first four games and they have a group of people that do that. So I suppose really I'm just looking for people to get in touch to let me know about their experiences of mentoring. So again, I can pull a paper together um, and pull all that research together and go and speak to county FAs, go and speak to the Football Association to see if there is anything I can do with other people's support to change that for newly qualified referees. I think that, you know, obviously I've just touched on my experience just prior to that. And I think that um, what's, what's obviously been really good for me is the fact that I did have that support and I did have somebody in the first few games and, and I feel uh, really lucky about that. And, I, and I, it's something that I hope uh, my my county in Durham have continued with under the, the under the new R, RDO, uh, and I feel like they will have because the management of the, uh, of, the, of, the of the county affairs has not changed, and the standards obviously in the northeast generally are, are obviously quite high. Obviously, we've you know we, we've produced a number of top level uh, referees in in sort of the last twenty years, so I think that you know it has proved to be a good. A put a good proving ground, but I do think it's 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 a big surprise to me. This I have to say, you know, obviously, I've I've talked about the fact that I'm I'm working with county FAs and, and I'm trying to help, uh, you know, in, in in places obviously amongst core groups and promotion candidates. Another main group is newly qualified officials, but it it does surprise me to be quite honest that um that in certain areas I would I I might, I, I may be the first bit of coaching that they're getting since they've qualified in terms of how to deal with some of the scenarios that they're going to face on a match day. I think also what would be interesting as well is to understand um, uh, what to what extent the, those referees are going into games where things like the respect barrier are in use, because I think that that would also um, would also be very interesting. But uh, I, I'm gathering that that your son was not with a, a mentor, sorry, was not with your son on, on his first game. Um, no, no, he wasn't. He, basically, there was me and his dad. Um, and, and I think we were probably that shocked at the time yeah. that I didn't know what I was allowed to say, what I was allowed to do, or whether I just literally had to stand back and, and, and oh. listen to it. And that's what I did. I wouldn't yeah. do that now. Yeah. If that happened now, um, I would take very different action, but I certainly wouldn't stand back and allow that to happen. Yeah. But a lot of young referees at our central venues in our junior league um, don't have their parents with them. No. Some of them are at venues where there are there are no volunteers there. Um, most of them are, but some of them, you know, their parents have no idea, you know, that, that this kind of stuff can go on. Yeah. We've had referees at our central venues been abused, been in tears, been shouted at, um, yeah. and we have a group of volunteers who will support those referees, and they do it extremely well. Um, but I would never let my son go referee without me being there or his dad. There's, there's, oh, there's no way. But he does tell me to be quiet. He heard yeah. me having a quiet word with a parent a couple of weeks ago who was abusing another referee, and I pointed out the yellow armband that he was wearing yeah. and said, look, you do realise that's a child you're shouting at. Yeah. Um, my son heard me because he's tuned into my voice, and at half time he came over and went, Mum, can you just be quiet? Let us ref, stop getting involved. And I said, I can't. I said, if I'm hearing an adult abusing a child, I will yeah. say something. Yeah. Um, but his games where he has mentors, I have to say, are so much better. And, and again, exactly like yourself and Amber have said, he gets a couple of things at half time about, you know, his, his signals being clearer, the sharpness of his whistle in certain situations. He got some feedback about positioning of his corners a couple of weeks ago. He's totally changed his positioning with corners now. Yeah. Um, his feedback, and I don't know why he doesn't get this, but he was told he needs to be a bit louder. You know, with a mum like me, how he's not loud, I don't know. Because <laughs> um, I've certainly got a loud voice. and I speak, people hear me. So, but uh, he gets a couple of things each week off a mentor. And he puts those into practice, so much so that one of the other referees that, that he, he works at the same venue as, his mum said to me, his signals are, are really clear, aren't they? And, and his, his whistles, you know, <clears throat> you can hear his whistle. 
And yeah. that is as a direct result of having a mentor. Another direct result of having a mentor is his confidence soared to the point where last season, later on, um, he sent a coach off who came storming across the pitch, swearing at another coach in an under-10s game. He showed him a red card. He went. Um, and then another situation two or three weeks ago where a coach was, was screaming about an offside. And at the end of the match, he approached the coach and said, if you carry on screaming and shouting at referees in an aggressive way like that, he said... We're going to lose referees in this league. That's why we have a shortage of young referees because yeah. people like you shout at us. And, yeah. and, and I was like, wow, wow. Yeah. he yeah. wouldn't have done that a year ago. He approached an adult in a very sensible, mature way and, and, and told him. Um, I, was, I was extremely proud. I missed the sending off, though. I would have liked to have been there to have seen that, but he was with his dad. Um, but it, it, because of the mentoring, he has got more confident. He handles difficult situations far better now he, he had a situation two weeks ago where unfortunately a young player um in an under 14s game um broke and dislocated his ankle 10 minutes into the game yeah. um we had no idea how to handle that situation but some certainly didn't because it's never happened before it's the first time luckily he had his mentor there from Stockport Referees Association who helped him through that whole process of how to manage that so mentors, they're absolutely crucial to our young referees. And it shows in North East Wales that if they have good mentors, you get the retention. I just want, I know it's uh, one from IFAB and it's the Lord change that's come in, but do you, do you feel, I don't, and I don't know if your son was refereeing before this law was brought in, but do you feel there's a significant difference now that coaches can be targeted? Um, absolutely. I mean, my son's only been refereeing for 12 months. So... He has only ever known that, but yeah. it takes an awful lot of guts and courage and the bottle for yeah. a fourteen-year-old to show an adult a red card. Yeah, um, and it takes time for them to get the confidence to do that. So I see it time and time again on social media. Mm. You know, more mature or older people or referees who've been doing it a long time say, "Well, they've got the tools; they can just show them a card." Yeah. But how tough is that? You know, and. Yeah. and and they will only do that when their confidence is built. And they can only do that with support, with development, with mentoring. And if they're just left on their own, how do they ever learn to have the confidence to use the tools at their disposal, i.e. red and yellow cards? And, and I just, bins. He had you bins. I just want to take that to, to use it as a point as well. The FA will say that uh, descents, uh, this and that, they're all down uh, statistically year on year because we've got like more games, but less descent, less this, less that. But the fact is, I think that there's a there's definitely a mindset where people don't want to or don't have the confidence to use these tools that are being given to them. So the FA tick, big win for us. We brought this in, a descent is down. The fact is, you've got a, like you say, a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old having to show a card to a 35 or 40-year-old. That's the same generational gap as like, them telling their parents off. Yeah. And I don't know how many children of that age would have the, the bottle to turn around and, and say, no, listen, mum, you've, you've, you've been, you're wrong there. So here is uh that's, that's going to cost you 10 pounds. <laughs> so, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but, and the FA needs to, to be honest with themselves and just acknowledge the fact yeah. that, um, that there is, I've noticed it so much since uh, COVID restrictions have lifted and football has restarted again. Um, it, the 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 extremes have gone way further out. So yes. the the people who are grateful and happy to be playing football are so grateful and happy, and they're just enjoying their game. But on the other end, the people that used it as as a, a release for their aggression and their pent up frustration that they've always done has because maybe their their nine to five or their Monday to Friday is a lot tougher now. There's a lot more uncertainty in their lives. So their release, their outlet, which was football on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday morning, has just gone off the scale and they've turned into some of the most difficult, horrible people to referee and officiate. Yeah. And I think that, you know, just touching on what, what you've said there as well, I think that, you know, I've heard a lot of positive things about not just the cards for coaches coming in, but also the sim bins um, for dissent. Um, and people saying, you know, that that has made it easier for younger referees to deal with difficult adults. But 
I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm, I've been an adult the whole time that that, um, that that since it's come in, but I would be, would be really interested, obviously, as well. And I'm sure Kerry would to understand whether that really is the case, whether the younger referees do feel that it, it's like a buffer and it, and it gives them that you know to be able because obviously it's a big thing to show a card, as Kerry said, but I think also to then have them in that sin bin does that. Does that help or does that diminish? I've heard it helps, but it'll be interesting to see, with particularly with those under 18s, newly qualified referees, what impact it has and how difficult or easy it is. Yeah. It, it, can I just stop throw something in there? I know you will probably get some people that will have the train of thought, well, if you've got a young referee who then doesn't have the confidence necessarily to show a coach a, a red card, should they be refereeing? But that would be a little bit like, so So at work, I look after a, a huge group of apprentices and some of our apprentices, um, they're, they're welding and fabrication apprentices and they're welding and learning to weld 20 ton steel beams, really complex jobs. So they're not going to do that right at the start. They're not going to have the skill to be able to do that particular task to the standard that we want. They will do that through mentoring, through support, mm -hmm. through time, through practice. It's exactly the same as our young referees. You cannot expect a 14-year-old or even an 18-year-old to necessarily in the first couple of games or the first couple of months to have the confidence to do that. They're exactly like apprentices. They need support. They need guidance. They need mentoring. They need practice. They need nurturing. And if we do all that, we, we get better referees at the end of it. But at the minute, it feels like in a lot of instances... As I say, we're just throwing them out there to be to be eaten alive to an extent and it's sink or swim. And some of them do swim. My son is now so much more confident. He loves his referee. He, he gets up on Saturday, Sunday morning with a smile on his face. He gets a, an under-14s game, his 11 v 11s, which he's recently started doing a lot of. And, and he buzzes from it. It's fantastic. But not everybody's like that and they need more support. They need more mentoring. Um, so we need to, we've got to find a way, regardless of resources, regardless of money, regardless of COVID, we have to find a solution to this. And, and, and the research maybe is, is the start of finding that solution. I think it, um, it touched on a few things there, mate, that I, I, I rewind a bit on. You said about when you're at a game, you, now you'll go to other parents who are abusing other referees and you're saying, that's a child, going to hand, hand band on. That's, this is the strategy that works. And I know some people don't re probably don't recognise it, but we do on Twitter. That's what we do on Twitter. We are the electronic version of you going over to a, a blue net on the side of a piss. Do you realise that's a kid? Do you, do you actually realise what you're doing? And what we find is with, with that strategy, other people now are, are, are tagging me in or sending me private messages or I don't want to say anything, Matt, but look at this, then we go after them. So we've got, it's sort of getting police now where people who, want, who don't want to do what, what you do but still, still as passionate and still as, you know, objectionable about it, they'll send it to me and then we go. So that, that's the first point I want, to, I want to drag in with you. But I think all of us addressing abuse in, in all our small ways will definitely, definitely change things for the better. Now, when you said about getting better referees from mentoring, you not only get that, you'll get referees. Because if you don't mentor them, we won't even have any referees, never mind good ones. And I think... And we can ever this, I can ever this right back to 20 years ago when we did our mentor around here and we took them to events and we took them to places and we've talked on here about RDOs. RDOs aren't RDOs. They, 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 they'll tell it themselves. They don't have time to go to a game and sit there with 10 referees just talking to a game. And, and I don't I know every one of them would love to do that, but they haven't got that. They're all inundated. We're, we're admin and they're because they're so busy during the day they need time off for their own families or their own referees careers they can't go off and give that back even though they want to so having them to do less admin and stuff like that would, would really help that happen from a, from a county FA where one RDO can do 10 or 20 mentors in one game yeah. it's not difficult having Zoom again stuff like this is, is, is really 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 changing, changing the landscape of it yeah. But there's one thing that really needs to be sorted out with mentoring is that the referees have got to want to be mentored. They've got to want to be challenged. They've got to want to be learned. A lot of them go into core, and this used to be the same with academies. 
they've never been sold. They've got a decision wrong. They've never been sold. They're in the wrong position. And they get to like 18. And I think they're going to be Premier League in, in six or seven years. And it absolutely pushes my buttons when I see someone saying, oh, I've just seen this referee. He's the next FIFA referee for this county. I'm like, what are you doing? Have you just realised that if that child doesn't get there, it's going to think they're a failure? You can't put these sorts of destinations on, on children. Oh, you're definitely going to get at least Football League. You're definitely going to at least get level three. If they don't, it's a massive failure for them. So I think how we mentor and how mentor is received needs to be looked at. And the national game strategy that was all thrown out a couple of years ago is completely disappeared. It, there isn't one. The DNA of refereeing. Go and find anyone talking about that. And what happens is the, the, the referees department particularly uh, are guilty of. They say these things, they want to do this, and then not, it's not what happens. If you even look at the FA refereeing Twitter account, look how active that is. It's terrible. Yeah. It's absolutely terrible. Here we are as a charity, battering everybody. No one gets a bean. How can we set up like that when you've got full-time employees at Wembley running it? Because I, as I know he runs it. And they're doing one, one tweet a day, maybe, and that's a retweet. They're not putting out, even through COVID, he did about, what, three Zoom meetings or three? That's just not good enough. No. That's just not good enough. And, and I think it's it's just everyone just allowing to be criticised. People criticise us, say we're too harsh on people. But, you know, what are you going to do about it? If we don't do anything, do we just stay silent? And it just keeps on going? Or do we... Do we actually ignite the discussion either way. And I think that's when everyone starts doing it a little bit, like you said, Kenny, you know, some some parents, some men won't go over to other people and go, hey, hey mate, that's a kid. You know, Max Ormish's dad said one of the most infuriating things he had to do was stand on the line and see his kid get threatened. And he was told that, of course, don't worry, we'll deal with it. We'll throw the book at them. Yeah. Oh, really? So even when you punch someone on camera, you're only going to get 10 years. That's all you're going to get. Because, you know, the, the idea is, oh, everyone needs to be rehabilitated, so give them a chance. Well, I think you need to draw the line there. You know, yeah. someone's just, just ban them for life. They made that choice. Yeah. And I think we, we, we got told a similar thing. So we got told, um, don't stand, stand away from the parents and coaches, you know, just, just stand away on your own, um, stay out of the way. And, and abuse is rare. It's very rare. You know, and then obviously, bang, you go into that first game and, and, and it's horrific. Um, actually standing away from the parents and coaches is totally the wrong thing to do. What you do is you arrive at the venue, you walk your son down the respect line, past the parents, you smile, you say, morning, hi, how are you? That's my son. Um, and inside, you've got this little Rottweiler going, just you dare. Just <laughs> you dare. Yeah. But you've got a big smile on your face. You're like, oh, God, it's great. It's not raining today. You know, pictures cleared up well. Got a bit of sunshine. Have a great game, everyone. He's with me. Yeah. And do you know what? It works. Not every parent, obviously, is, is, is as perhaps as um, in your face as I am or maybe as confident. But I actually find that that does work and it works to make yourself very visible as a parent and let the other parents know that your child is not there on his own and he's not there to be shouted at or abused. And, and, and I know it works because there was one game he did where a lovely dad was sat on his chair with his can of lager at an under-12s game and he That's shouted at his son, Oi, you should have gone to Specsavers. And his wife or girlfriend turned around and gave him a crack across the head and gone, shut up, the referee's mother is stood over there. Not to peep out of him after that. I didn't even have to say anything. I just smiled at her and winked and she smiled at me and, and it was all good. But you generally get, when you admit to being the referee's mother, you get this look, you get this. And they, and they go, oh, that must be so difficult. And I go, it is sometimes. It's really great when we have parents like you who are dead positive and really nice and supportive. It's hard when, when we get ones that are shouty and, and they're being abusive to my child. And those parents then are lovely. You've got to engage with people. You've Absolutely. got to talk to them. Um, you know, but it, it's, you still need these, these are, everybody needs mentoring, they need support, they need feedback, but they need it done in the right way. So definitely not the way that it was done for you, Anne. I would love to get hold of that assessor 
and invite them on one of my leadership courses I run at work to teach them about mentoring, coaching, positive language, the words that we use. But how many of the mentors that we've got have actually had training themselves? And the ones that have had training, what's the standard of that training? Who, who are teaching the mentors? So again, that's another issue. I know. And, and it's really inter- absolutely interesting. It's, it's, another, it's a conversation for another day, which we'll definitely have you back on, is the fact that no one regulates what the referees department put out as quality of education. Yeah. The, yeah. Ofsted can't look at them because Ofsted would just say, poof. You wouldn't touch any near the standards of offset. We've said for a long time, the referees departments, all that training should be in FA learning. But why have we got one department of the whole of football? Different. And, into, and then when some, something come out on COVID, all of a sudden they said, oh, we're, we've talked to FA learning and, um, and they, they're okay with us doing it more or less with the FA speak. So why did he all of a sudden mention FA learning? They never mentioned it before. Because we flashed it up saying... During COVID, FA Learning with all the coaches' badges and all that, they've been getting loads of stuff. But we've been getting one or two little webinars. You know, it's disgraceful. I just don't know why FA Learning hasn't got all the refereeing. And then you have things that happened with, with, with us, Kerry. We talked about this in the last blog. When I, when I was working with the FA and I was running the, the well, running the whole of the Southwest Academy, and I was the, the coordinator for it. So we used to have Anthony Taylor doing Cheshire up that way. He st- I think he still does. Kevin Friend doing the Midlands. All really, really good people we could all bounce off. As soon as I stopped doing that, I was fine. Every- everyone listened to Scouts. Everyone listened to Matt Gasty. As soon as I stepped away, literally the week later, said, I don't want to do that. I don't believe in core. Because he was swapping it all over to core. I just don't believe in the word excellence in anything like that. But now I did ref support. All of a sudden, I was incredible. The same person. I wasn't grateful just because I was a different organisation. And then they started saying, oh, they're not approved. Well, neither is the FA and the FA education are approved. So all this language that you go back to, the positive language is really, really important. And, and when, you, when you reflect on, on what we did in the beginning as a charity, we just wanted to help people. They thought it wouldn't happen. And then when we started happening, that's when they started putting obstacles in a way because people were asking, how oh, come they can do it for nothing? No one gets paid, nothing. I have all this success. We have 12 coaches going out within months of us, but you've only got 10 in core. Well, what's all that about? So this is where bar- barriers started to come. Then we were getting more people promoted in our schemes than the than core was. So that caused the problem. They started saying, oh yeah, but we had 20, we had 20 cup finals and you never had any. They're like a real terrible, terrible thing to do. So with the positive language, this is tying back to you, Kerry, is do you think it's wise to have the word excellence? in, in a, a program that, that trains referees. And before you answer, the reason I say it's not is that when I used to go to games and, and you see an FA badge, you only did it once or twice early on, and then I never wore an FA badge, badge again because of it. Are you with that referee? He's crap. Are you is this? Are you is that? And then when we started doing core, I went to a game to watch a line on, and the referee was in core. And the bloke said, well, what's that? Oh, yeah, the referee's in court. And the coach was trying to say, he's a good ref today. Because he's in court, he's going to be fucking brilliant. Oh, five my friends. He's going to be brilliant. What happened is, the first mistake that person made, oh, that's excellent, is it? Yeah, you tell me that excellent. You got excellent on your, on your coach. It's a massive, massive problem, I believe. But they just go on with it because I don't see why you would have... Are we trying to achieve excellence, training referees? Or are we trying to just... Referees to be better than the way when they engage with us. Are we trying to get excellence? What's your take on that? Um, and just quickly on mine, I've got to go in two minutes, guys. I'll leave a pause. So just quickly on mine, our county FA, and I will name them on, on this occasion. So Manchester County FA, don't use the word call. Um, they have a pathway and they have their, their new, new referees. They have development group. Then they have their academy group. And I love those words. So my son was extremely lucky that he was chosen as as one of four referees on the new course to join the development group. He doesn't make a big deal out of it. I don't make a big deal out of it. Pre-COVID, he went along once a month. He worked with other referees. They had lots of training sessions. They had lots of discussions and lots of development. He thoroughly enjoyed it. But there is no, there's no edge to it. The, you know, he, he doesn't go, I'm in core because there's no excellence. It's about developing him as a referee. 
and that's what he really enjoys. And it's we don't treat it as a big deal because it is about development. That that that's it. So I actually really like the fact that Manchester FA don't use the word club. They, yeah. they, they just don't go there. Yeah. It's great. And, and let's give a shout out to, to the chief exec of Manchester FA. I've, I've dealt with him a couple of years with various things. I know we had some communication with him, with, with, with your yeah. boys. But he is a very forward thinking, cracking chief exec, even though he's a Man United fan. Oh, you know, no. no. But he is a top, top like Colin Bridgeford. So <laughs> he happens to listen to this. We'd love to get some more conversations going with him. I know he's a good man. I know he comes from the right intention. Sometimes his hands might be tired, but he's a wonderful, progressive chief exec and should deserve a shout out. So, so well done. Yeah. Eddie, I know you've got to go now. We're commitments and all that. Loads of coaching and mentoring stuff. The but good stuff. The good stuff. Listen, I think, I think you're going to be a game changer. I, I, we'll you're see. Got Eddie, mate, and I think there's plenty more to come from you. And I, I think you're you involved with helping us. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so no. much for coming on the pod. It's been brilliant speaking to you. And- no, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really good. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Kerry. You take care, mate. See y'all soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.